Hey, faithful listener, thanks for tuning in to the P40 Ministries daily podcast. This podcast is dedicated to helping you grow spiritually so you can grow personally. Let's grow together by building a consistent Bible reading routine. This is Jen, your host, and today we will be discussing the book of Exodus. Hello and good morning, friends and faithful listeners. Thank you so much for tuning in to the P40 Ministries podcast with your host, Jen. And also we have a guest on the podcast today, and this is Stephanie Roussel. And I first learned from her because I really, really like her podcast. And I started tuning into her podcast called Gospel Spice, and she has such a cute accent. (laughs) And I love it. And she starts out her podcast episodes by saying, bonjour, and I love it. (laughs) (laughs) So, Stephanie, uh, introduce yourself to uh, the listeners of P40 Ministries and let them know where you're from and what you do on your podcast. I think that'd be great. Mm -hmm. Well, bonjour, Jen, for starters. I obviously have to start with that. So I'm French, obviously, if I'm using this. (laughs) I am truly French, as you can probably hear. I joke that I've been trying to get rid of my French accent for about 30 years, and now it is interesting that people are actually liking it. So uh, God works in all sorts of different ways ways, including our accents, including our culture. And that is something I have discovered over the last two decades as I have lived on three continents, four countries and five cities through six professional roles, which has given me the ability to truly um, use culture as a way to decipher what is happening around me and has forced me to understand the cultures that surround me that are sometimes extremely different from my own. Uh, I'm French. I currently live in the States, but I've also lived, like I said, uh, in Africa, for example. So uh, different cultures that I think we all need to understand uh, are important in our experience of scripture. The fact that you and I are uh, Westerners living as women in the 21st century definitely impacts how we view scripture, because if we had been born, I don't know, in the 16th century as Chinese people with the male gender, I think even as if we were Christians, we would probably approach scripture a little differently, wouldn't you say? And so that's kind of what we do on the Gospel Spice podcast, which you kindly mentioned, is that we bring the cultural flavors of the first century Jewish culture into a 21st century Western approach to scripture. And we do this by basically taking passages that might be very common and familiar to a Western Christian audience, especially if you have grown up in the church, and we try to spice things up and bring out flavors that we may not have tasted so much. If we Westerners like our all-purpose garlic salt a bit much, we may forget about the cilantro, the cumin, the cardamom of the first century Jewish culture. And because I'm French, sometimes... We take a little vacation from the Jewish culture and we dive into the French culture through some funny words and expressions in French that might have some bearing on our spiritual understanding of scripture. So that's what we do on the Gospel Spice podcast. And that is so important because actually when I had Greg Kokel on the podcast a while back, he mentioned that it's important for us to not compare Old Testament scripture with nowadays, because it's so different, we are supposed to compare Old Testament scripture to back then, if that makes sense. So it's important what you're doing, I think, uh, Stephanie, is to really bring that historical context into the Bible so that people nowadays can really understand what is going on. And you know what? It's kind of funny. You mention spices all the time in your podcast. And um, <laughs> fun fact, and I don't know if anybody really knows this about me. Some of my closest friends and family members do, but I can't smell very well. I have a terrible sense of smell. And so spices... I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's okay. But um, I always like to say I really I love very, very hot, spicy food. Like people laugh at me. I, I love hot and spicy food. And I like to say I like to feel my food rather than taste it. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, it's actually probably a huge blessing because you know how they say, for example, that uh, cayenne pepper is really healthy for us, but we can, I can only have it in very small doses because of its pungent smell, which 
uh, has consequences on how I taste it. And so the fact that you cannot taste your cayenne pepper probably allows you to ingest larger <laughs> amounts than I definitely can. It was funny, actually, we had, um, I had the privilege of recently welcoming Dallas Jenkins of The Chosen on my podcast. And he was saying exactly that every day he has a smoothie with hot red cayenne pepper uh, because it's really good for his metabolism and he's a bit of a health, he's extremely health conscious. And so he was saying how painful it is to drink it, but then it's good for him. So at least you don't have that pain. Right. <laughs> <laughs> very, very true. But uh, Stephanie is beginning her fall series of the Gospel Spice podcast, and I'm actually going to drop a link to that. And uh, it, actually, Stephanie, if you could elaborate a little bit more about the fall series that are coming up in just a, is it a week or so, I believe? And yeah, in just the next few days. Yeah, September 27th. So very briefly, uh, we like to take our audience. We are uh, we have an audience in 116 countries as of today and literally growing every day. And we reach thousands upon thousands of people. And uh, what we do is that we alternate guests uh, like, you know, Dallas Jenkins, like I mentioned, and many others with in-depth Bible studies that I have the privilege and the honor to teach. And so this coming season for fall 2021, we are um, inviting you to experience the tabernacle from a Christocentric perspective. So we are bringing to bear all of our knowledge and experience of the Jewish culture in order to bring to life the symbolism of the tabernacle. And uh, this is a series that we've done live with a live audience that I taught live a while back. And the feedback we got from the live audience was that it really was it felt like we were inside the tabernacle with Christ. And so because we're using a lot of illustrations and storytelling, it's a very palatable, relatable, easy to understand, dive into the complexities of the tabernacle. And some people said it was kind of like taking a seminary class, but it felt like we were using um, picture books that a toddler could understand. And so I think that was a compliment. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like one, <laughs> but I think that's great. So I will definitely drop a link to the Gospel Spice podcast in the bio of this podcast so that you can go over and subscribe to Stephanie Roussel's podcast and take a listen to everything that she does over there. I, I highly recommend it. But today we are going to be discussing Exodus chapter 23 verses 1 through 9. And I'm going to have Stephanie help me here. I'm going to ask her some questions and she's going to uh, do her best to answer. And as always, I will be reading out of the W.E.B. version of the Bible, but please feel free to read out of whatever version you usually read out of. So let's go ahead and start. You shall not spread a false report. Don't join your hand with the wicked to be a malicious witness. You shall not follow a crowd to do evil. You shall not testify in court to side with a multitude to pervert justice. You shall not favor a poor man in his cause. If you meet your enemy's ox or his donkey going astray, you shall surely bring it back to him again. If you see the donkey of him who hates you fallen down under his burden, don't leave him. You shall surely help him with it. You shall not deny justice to your poor people in their lawsuits. Keep far from a false charge and don't kill the innocent and righteous, for I will not justify the wicked. You shall take no bribe, for a bribe blinds those who have sight and perverts the words of the righteous. You shall not oppress an alien, for you know the heart of an alien, since you were aliens in the land of Egypt. So Stephanie, what stood out to you the most regarding this passage of scripture? Mm, honestly, there's uh, so much I hope we can dive into. Uh, first of all, you know, I, I think maybe your audience would agree with me that this would not be a top 10 favorite passage for anyone. I have never heard anyone tell me, oh my goodness, Exodus 23 verses 1 to 9 are my life verses. Um, <laughs> you know, it's one of those lesser known, somewhat, it feels maybe a little dusty or irrelevant, or maybe it belongs to a time far, far away in another galaxy. But actually, I think it's extremely relevant to today because the overall theme that I see in this particular passage, but that applies, I think, in all of the law of Moses as laid out in Exodus, is that God is telling his people to behave differently than those around them because they are set apart. Yes, exactly. Because they are chosen. Mm -hmm. uh, the word set apart is a word that I love. Uh, it's actually the root in, in Greek to the word holy. 
to be set apart is to be holy, is to be not, you know, I have special dishes that I use for Christmas and Easter, for example, I set them apart. They're not my daily dishes. And in the same way, God sets us apart not because of anything we've done. Actually, if you look at the people of Israel, they were honestly a pretty pathetic people. Uh, there's there's not a whole lot they could boast. And in the same way, in Christ, um, there's not a whole lot we can boast in ourselves except in Christ crucified, but they have been chosen. And in the same way, we are chosen because we are not slaves, but we are children. Mm. And if I were to summarize this particular segment, and I think as we dive into it, we'll see this a little more, uh, I would use the expression, it's about the discipline of integrity. Mm-hmm. And plus, it's just a better way for these people to live. I mean, it It's talking here about favoritism in verse two, or even in verse one, actually not spreading false reports. Don't join your hand with the wicked to be a malicious witness. I mean, this is all talking about the court system. I mean, we've talked about the court a lot going through the P40 Ministries podcast and how um, God put this system in place for his people and how it was a very civilized kind of thing and way beyond its time for this particular time period, I mean, this was extremely different mm-hmm. than any anything that they had back in the ancient days. So <clears throat> the fact that God is putting this in place, I think, is very significant as well. And just teaching them, not only should they be holy and set apart as completely different from other people, but also that this is a very good way for them to live, is not to stab each other in the back or hurt each other or anything like that. Yeah, I'd love for us over the course of our conversation, uh, I'd love to point out how every single one of these verses uh, taken one by one, and we can, you know, I'd love to hash them out one by one, how they um, actually point to Jesus. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's interesting. I would love for you to do that. So in starting then in verse um, one and two, actually, Verses one through three. One to three. Yes. Yeah. One to three go together. I agree. And yes. actually one to three and six to eight, uh, in my opinion, my humble uh, opinion go together because they're actually uh, verses six to eight repeat one to three uh, with a slightly different wording. There's some nuances there, but the gist of the meaning is the same. And what I love to do when I read the Old Testament is um, because I always want to put Christ in the center, uh, I'm always asking myself, what does this tell me about Christ? How does every single verse of scripture point to Christ? You remember Jesus on the road to Emmaus with the disciples and how he opened the scriptures to them, showing all the way back from Moses and the Pentateuch, which we are in, how it all points to him. And so specifically, what did Jesus potentially tell those disciples about Exodus 23 verses one to nine? Well, I don't know. I wasn't there. But if I had to guess, I would say maybe he said, well, when God tells you not to spread a false report, not joining the wicked, not following a crowd in wrongdoing, not testifying in a lawsuit to pervert justice, and then not denying justice to the poor or not showing favoritism to the poor in the law lawsuit, uh, staying away from a false accusation, not killing the innocent and the just. These are all the things that those who were to uphold the law in Jesus's day did to him. This is the precise list of what the Pharisees did to Jesus. Mm. In mm-hmm. other words, the Sanhedrin, which was the body of authority, the court, the justice court of the Jewish people, did the exact opposite of what God told them to do for their own good. So this this shows me clearly, Jesus is saying here, this is how you should treat everyone because I allowed you not to treat me that way. I allowed you to be on the receiving end of the ultimate injustice so that you could be on the receiving end, not of justice, but of grace. And the fact that he is repeating it one to three and then six to eight, this is a powerful mnemonic device. If you want to remember something, you repeat it. I mean, a modern science tells us uh, we need an average of seven to 10 times for something to be repeated in order for us to memorize it. When we memorize scripture or whatever else, it takes repetition. And culturally for the Jews, because they were an oral culture of memorizing scripture, because, you know, it was not, they they didn't have the printing press, Um, the cultural element to emphasize something in their culture was repetition. Mm. So this is a clear statement. Hey guys, this is what you're supposed to do and you're going to fall short. And uh, Jesus is the ultimate example of that. 
but that's um that's a to me that's how it points to jesus through right. the pharisees falling short um and if the pharisees who were experts in the law fell short i fall short too Right. And that, that's an excellent point. I really like that you tied it back because right now we are also going through the book of Mark on the podcast. And uh, we just finished Matthew uh, maybe a couple months ago. And we read about this, how the the Pharisees and Sanhedrin were doing the opposite of everything they knew that they shouldn't be doing. They absolutely had a good understanding of the law. They knew all about Exodus chapter 23. And uh, they were doing the opposite because they were hypocritical. Mm -hmm. And yes, I, I, I agree with that. I think that's a very interesting point to tie that back to what we are talking about in Matthew and Mark recently as well. So then what was God trying to communicate to his people through this? Because, I mean, we talked about that a little bit already, but you said that since they had to memorize all of this, they were a... Um, they were a people that didn't have the, the printing press yet, obviously. So what was God trying to communicate by talking about this to Moses um, other than, uh, you mm -hmm. know, justice and, and whatever else like that? Right. And, and again, I'm going to tie this back to Jesus because that's uh, you, you can't have me talk about scripture without linking it to Jesus. So that's what I'm going to do. And uh, just like, you know, if you look at there's a there's blocks, um, there are sandwich slices in this passage. You've got verses one and three and six to eight, which we just looked at, which um, I think show how the Pharisees fell short when we apply these verses to Jesus's context. And in contrast, if you look at the middle verses of the sandwich, verses four and five in particular, um, and then verse nine, kind of on the outer layer of the sandwich, if I was to use you know, I use food, food metaphors all the time. It's terrible. Uh, but in this case, I would say verses four and five and then nine um, actually point to Jesus directly. When, when God tells the Israelites, if you come across your enemies, a stray ox or donkey, you must return it to him. Well, Jesus said, leave the 99 to go for the one. Mm. Mm -hmm. I see a straight parallel between leaving the 99 to go for the one. And that's the one that is still God's enemy at that point. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus is going to the one who is the opposite of the Pharisee, the one who is the sinner, who knows it and who seeks God. And then in verse five, um, when, you know, if you see the donkey of someone who hates you lying helpless under its load and you want to refrain from helping it, you must help with it. So regardless of what you want to do, you want to do the right thing. This tells me, this reminds me of two passages in Jesus's life. One is when he would heal on the Sabbath. Mm. When he says, you guys, like if you have a sheep that falls in a, um, in a well on the Sabbath, you Pharisees, hypocrites, you go and rescue that sheep because it actually is kind of straight out of this passage. But then if you do that, why don't you do this for uh, healing someone on the Sabbath? Right. Uh, so that's one of the examples. And then the other, even more famous, which is so much in the face of the Pharisees is the Good Samaritan because he does the very thing that is here said that he should do, which is mm -hmm. to help his enemy even when in Jesus's parable or story, um, the Levite didn't do it, the priest didn't do it. And they were both the guys who knew Exodus 23, 5 inside out probably, but they didn't do it. The Samaritan, the commoner who may not have had the education, he's the one who did what Jesus upholds as being right and good and true. So and you, know, you see, mm -hmm. oh, I'm sorry. You know what? comes to my mind when you mention that also one more story is when I think I believe it was the Sermon on the Mount Matthew chapter 6 when Jesus says if a Roman soldier tells you to carry his pack for a mile which is exactly what they could do in Jesus's mm -hmm. day and age they had mm -hmm. yeah. Roman soldiers mm -hmm. had right. absolutely right yes mm -hmm. and uh, Jesus says instead of going one mile with them go with them too so everything so even back in God's law right here He's already teaching his people exactly what he wants, which is mercy and love towards other people, even if those other people may be cruel to you or hate you in some way or whatever else. It, it, it just it's showing God's mercy and love. And since we are supposed to be a holy people and we are supposed to be Christ alike, if that makes sense, or Christians, you know, means uh, little Christ, since we are supposed to model 
Christ, and Jesus did all that for people who hated him. I mean, when he was up on the cross, he was dying for their sins as people are spitting on him and, and calling him all sorts of terrible names and whatever else. If we're supposed to model that, and even back here in the law, it already shows how unchanging God is, because this was written thousands of years before Jesus was even born. Mm -hmm. Agreed. So why is this important now? So we talked a little bit about the time of Jesus, but what can we take away from this right now, Stephanie, do you think? Mm. Oh, that's such a good question. Uh, to try to keep it brief, um, I would say this, the law in general and this passage in particular teaches us about freedom from the law in order to enter freedom for the law. That's how I would summarize it. Uh, interestingly, when you ask me to speak on this passage, uh, in my personal reading, I'm currently in Galatians. And uh, Galatians 3 and 4 in particular, I won't read them, but I would highly recommend your audience check out Galatians 3, uh, 16 to 21 and 4, 8 to 10, because it talks about freedom from the law. And very interestingly, if you look at the context, I love looking at context, what's happening just before our passage or what's happening just after. Well, this is Exodus 23. Uh, in Exodus 17, so just six chapters ago, which is a matter of weeks ago, probably, uh, there's the story of Moses striking the rock in order for the people of Israel to drink. He actually struck the rock on two different occasions, one at the very early onset of the wilderness journey before the Ten Commandments are given, that's Exodus 17, and one at the very, very end of his life, that's Numbers 20, and that's the one that um, led God to not allow Moses into the promised land. So the first one, Exodus 17, uh, these are two separate events recorded clearly as separate events, and it's in the recent past, Exodus 17, the people were thirsty, and God tells Moses to strike the rock with his rod, but there's a very interesting feature because God says, just before you strike the rock, I am going to position myself on the rock. In other words, Moses, when you strike the rock, you're going to have to strike me because I'm between you and the rock. That's Christ. Christ was struck so that we could drink from the fountain of life. So that's what's happening. This is the powerful illustration of Exodus 17. Now, why is Numbers 20 happening? Why is Moses not allowed into the promised land for striking the rock on a separate occasion? On that separate occasion in Numbers 20, God tells Moses to speak to the rock, not to strike it. So that's a difference. And Moses chooses to strike it. And there's a host of reasons that show that Moses had grown somewhat arrogant because he says, we will deliver you, not, we will deliver you, not God, but like me and God together, um, we're going to do this. So he was kind of putting himself on an equal footing with God, but also he strikes the rock a second time. And Numbers 20 says he struck the rock twice. We don't know if he actually struck it twice on Numbers 20 or if it's once in Exodus 17 and once in number 20. It does not matter because what this tells us is the rock has already been struck once. Jesus has already died for our sins. We do not need to struck, strike the rock a second time. And we are freed from the law. We do not need to uphold the 613 commandments because Jesus has fulfilled the law. So when Moses, two of his key teachings are strike the, the rock a first time with God in between, that's Christ on the cross, and then speak to the rock. Do not strike it a second time speak to it, interact with it, interact with the law, be freed from the law in order to uphold the law, not so that it can save you. And uh, I could go into way, more, I'm a nerd, I could go into so much more detail on the context even closer with Exodus 19, but we I don't think we have time, right, Jen? You'd rather we move on? One thing I want to say, though, with your reading in Galatians, it's funny because I also recently read Galatians as well in my personal uh, reading. And uh, I think the overall basis of it is even if we would want to follow the law, first off, we can't. We just can't. We have to be under grace. And God put the law in place, I believe, at the beginning to prove to people you need a savior and so i think that is the whole premise of yeah the law. actually um yeah actually so it's freedom from the law and then freedom to actually do the law and that's where grace come in comes in and um it's not about the law it's about the relationship that is um 
experience through, yes, indeed, obedience, but through the grace of obedience, because there is nothing you can do to earn or to lose the love of God or the relationship with God that you have in Christ Jesus. And I think that is kind of what Hosea 6 verse 6 was talking about when Jesus mentions that verse all the time when he says, uh, I desire mercy and, and not, not sacrifice. sacrifice. Mm -hmm. Yes. Absolutely. So to conclude, I would like to talk about verse 9 here. It says, you shall not oppress an alien, for you know the heart of an alien, since you were aliens in the land of Egypt. Now, Stephanie, as someone mm. who is from France, what does this mean to you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I love it. Well, first, I think we should treat uh, the foreigners among us with a lot of grace. I have lived most of my life as a foreigner. Um, and again, this points to Jesus because Jesus was a foreigner in the land of Egypt in his early childhood years. So even this points to Jesus. And this teaches us that um, compassion comes from experience. When you have lived as a foreigner most of your life, you have compassion for the, for the foreigners among you. And spiritually speaking, we are sojourners and aliens. And so we are sojourning in this land. Uh, that's in Philippians 3. And so Jesus, having lived in Egypt, here role models two things. First, uh, the reality of being a foreigner. And also symbolically, Egypt being this land of slavery, he has taken uh, our slavery to sin to the cross so that we could be freed from Egypt uh, symbolically. Mm -hmm. And the fact that it's saying here, I think, and I would conclude with that, is that when here Exodus 23, 9 teaches us to apply justice to the enemy and to the foreigner alike, that's the gist of the passage, Jesus actually takes it a, a step further. When he says, love your neighbor as yourself, your neighbor is, yes, it's your neighbor, it's your friend, but it's also your enemy. It's also the foreigner among you but love that person just like you love yourself. Jesus is taking this to the next level and he's saying the way to freedom from the law and freedom for the law is obedience and surrender and to truly, um, and that's my personal motto, to truly delight in the glory of God. And in this case, manifested through obedience to his law. Right. Well, thank you, Stephanie, so much for coming on the podcast. I think we had a great discussion about this, and uh, I loved having your perspectives on. And uh, this is why I love having guests, because they bring a whole new perspective I never would have even thought of. Because when I go through the Old Testament, I don't think to apply it back to Jesus, even though... <laughs> Even though I know that, you know, it, it all does tie back to Jesus, it's um, I just like to talk about the historical context of it and all that. So thank you, Stephanie, so much. And um, I will definitely drop a link to her podcast in the bio of this podcast episode so you can navigate over there. And I'll probably drop her um website link as well so you can connect with her. But friends and faithful listeners, thank you so much for tuning in. Happy listening and God bless. <laughs>